Hello everybody, how are you all doing? It's Len, I hope you're doing well. Today I'm here to talk you through how I planned my solo trip to Japan while not really having any budget and practically no real travel experience. So hopefully by now, all of you already know that I traveled to Japan in October of 2017 all by myself for about 20 days. And I went to Tokyo, then traveled south to Kyoto, Osaka, Nara, then again south to Hiroshima, Miyashima, Okunoshima before heading back up to Tokyo with a brief stop in Hakone on the way. Prior to this trip, I had barely traveled alone, let alone planning an entire trip of this magnitude all by myself from A to Z, me being solely responsible for my own well-being and safety so very adult-like and completely overwhelming also at the time where i decided that i was going to go to japan which was early 2017 i did not have the money for the trip i did not have any of it in fact at that time and still to this day i had no real income because i'm trying to make it in the creative field so i had no idea when and where that money was going to come from but I had decided that no matter what I was going to go to Japan in autumn of 2017 and as if by magic, the money came through. I got a job in June, a creative job of two months, which was confirmation, the confirmation I needed for me to realize that, oh my God, this trip is really going to happen. So this part of the backstory might not seem that interesting for you because it's not a clear how to, but you guys should know that I've been wanting to go to Japan since I was about 14 and it didn't matter how much I wanted it, it never really seemed to happen for me because I was too young, had no money, couldn't do this, always something seemed to come in the way until I actively decided that I was going to go that year and not going wasn't even an option. So I went to Japan for about 20 days all by myself on a tight budget and had an amazing time and I'm going to tell you how I did it. This video might end up being a little long and I did consider cutting it into different videos but I think that it's better for you if I just put all the information into one video like the ultimate guide type thing <laughs> but I will create little segments for you to skip to and from so just check out the description below for timings also I want to add that I am clearly not a travel expert this is what worked out for me with my research and what I found along the way so don't just take my word for it do your own fair share of research and figure out what works for you the very first thing you want to decide is when you're going to be traveling to Japan. And to help you figure that out, you want to ask yourself, what do I want my trip to look like? Now, you don't need to get into specifics and into very great amount of detail. You just want a general image of how it's going to be and what you want to feel. You want to take weather into account when thinking of key activities that you're going to want to be doing since seasons in Japan are very different and distinct from one another. Some months are punctuated with heavy rain and typhoon-like weather. So do you want to climb Mount Fuji, view the cherry blossoms or the red autumn leaves? Do you want to travel from city to city using the bullet train? Make sure that you match up your desires with the best time of year you want to visit. You also want to take crowds into consideration and that was a big one for me as I wanted to go at a time where there weren't supposed to be that many people. It was better for my mood and my stress and my experience. So September would have been perfect except I found out that it was a month where it was supposed to rain heavily and November is a month where the beautiful momiji come out, the red autumn leaves and that ultimately draws a lot of crowds in. So I chose October for my time to visit Japan. Also since October was still considered off season I'm pretty sure some of the prices were lower. Finally have an approximative idea of where you're going to be so that you know at which airport you're going to be landing which brings me to my next point. Now that you have a rough idea of when and where you want to go, and I insist on the word rough, you can start booking and planning things, starting with your plane ticket. Believe me, once you have done and booked those plane tickets, it will be a huge thorn out of your side. In my experience, in my little Japan experience, I have discovered that there are many thorns 
to have when planning a big trip but plane tickets is definitely one of the bigger ones as its price would determine the budget for the rest of my trip in the end i booked my flight two months in advance and here are a few things i did to find my perfect flight ticket first of all i knew exactly what i wanted before going looking for it i want the cheapest direct flight i could get out of brussels into either narita or haneda cheap for obvious reasons but i also wanted a direct flight no discussion because it was my first time flying internationally it was my first time booking a flight so the only thing i wanted to have to do was get on that one plane one plane one flight that was what i wanted know what you want know your priorities and know on what you're willing to be flexible Next, I did research, watched a whole bunch of videos about how to find the best tickets, which days were the best days to book, which times were the best times to book. And I put like price alerts on all the typical price comparing finding websites such as Skyscanner, Kayak, Google Flights, and I'm sure there were many more because I remember my inbox being completely flooded every day with price alerts, <laughs> emails. But in the end, the platform that helped me find my perfect flight was Hopper, which is an app for your phone. And if I remember correctly, because I have not used it since then, they show you which dates are the best dates to book, and they tell you when you should wait a little longer or when you should be like booking that flight because they don't think a better one will come along. You have the options, and I was on all the alerts for two weeks like a hawk and it didn't budge i was stuck at the 900 euros and it was so it was it was a lot for me 900 euros was a lot and finally i found the perfect flight through hopper two weeks after like stressing out at 740 euros so direct flight brussels to narita 740 euros all together and I booked that flight directly through the airline which was ANA I'm pretty sure you can book it through Hopper but I went directly to the source so first big expense done 740 euros for a round trip to Tokyo when you'll have booked your flight when you'll have your tickets and the trip will suddenly feel oh so very real when you'll know your departure date, your arrival date, and which airport you'll be using, that's when the fun begins. Now you know how many days your trip is going to be and where you landed. But before you do anything else, you need to figure out where you're going, what you're doing. And that means time for research and brainstorming. Here's what I did. I watched a ton a ton of videos and read through guides, website, blog posts, and I wrote down everything that seemed interesting to me. Literally everything that was, mm, that, that seems cool, I wrote it down. Then I narrowed it down. I narrowed everything down until I had something that looked like a well organized itinerary for me it was moving from tokyo down to hiroshima while stopping in cities in between like osaka and kyoto so i had a loop planned out once i had decided how many days i was going to be staying in which area taking into account the days where i was going to be traveling from city to city so that can sometimes be a lost days because you're spending it in the train anyhow once i figured out how many days i was going to be in each area i could start matching up activities in each city i was going to visit and grouping them and also dividing the activities into categories such as cultural food shopping nightlife and as i went on i realized that it was easier to divide the larger cities into smaller areas matching up the activities per area that way i had a basic idea of how the city was set and also it was easier later to plan out my days for example if you're in tokyo and you want to do a lot of shopping you are probably going to be around shinjuku and harajuku and shibuya which is not close to reno where you're planning on visiting the zoo it's in i'm not sure how this is going to be reversed but it's an opposite quadrants so it does help hope you're following me so far so know your cities how many days you're going to be in them what you can do in each city and if it's a large city divide it into quadrants into areas which will help 
on location. So the more you know about where you're going to be going, where you're going to be visiting, the easier it'll be for you to choose your sleeping accommodation slash arrangements. This said, certain areas, even if they are close to where you think you're going to be spending the most time, might be more expensive than others. So look around for, for example, Tokyo. I uh, heard that Ueno and Asakusa were ch was a cheaper place to be staying at, which is incidentally where I ended up staying at. It's time to take care of another thorn before we move on to accommodation and that is the issue of the JR Pass. The JR Pass is a transportation pass available to people visiting on a tourist visa. And this pass allows you to ride on all JR lines in determined areas in Japan, which includes unlimited use of on JR ferries, JR trains, JR subways, and of course some of the bullet trains, Shinkansen, which is the main advantage of the JR Pass, since Shinkansens can be really expensive, especially if you use it more than once. The price of the JR Pass is determined whether you take the 7-day pass, the 14-day or the 21-day pass. All of them relatively expensive and not always worth it depending on what you're going to be doing. But since you need to order your pass and collect the voucher before you leave in Japan, you need to be making that decision fairly early in the process as it will determine how you're going to be getting around in Japan and it will also drastically change your budget whether you take it or not. Freaking out yet? Well, I was. Now, I was going to be doing a lot of traveling from city to city with the Shinkansen, so the JR Pass did seem to be the best option. But that meant taking the 21 day JR Pass, which came to 443 euros, and at the time that seemed like a huge amount of money and it was a huge chunk off of my budget and I hadn't even looked at sleeping arrangements yet and I had to make this decision. In the end though, it all came down to comfort and time versus price. The alternative to not taking the Shinkansen and the JR Pass was taking the night bus. There are night buses available to travel from city to city and the night bus was much much cheaper but I had to take into account that even though it is a night bus, I was probably not gonna sleep that well, if at all, which meant being tired on location in the cities and maybe not having as much fun and enjoying myself as much as I would if I would had a good night's rest. Also traveling by bus does take much longer, which would take away precious time from my Japan adventure time. One way to calculate if buying the JR Pass is justified with the amount of traveling you're going to be doing within Japan is to use a JR Pass calculator, which are available on many different websites if you just type up those words in Google. Take things into account like uh, maybe using the Narita Express, which is covered by the JR Pass, to and from Narita Airport into Tokyo, or riding the um, JR Ferry to and from Miyajima. And obviously all local forms of JR transportation, JR trains, JR subway lines, and JR buses. If you haven't guessed yet, I did end up taking the 21-day JR Pass and I do not regret doing so. In fact, I think it was one of the best decisions I could have made because it took off so much of the stress away. I could hop on any train or any form of transportation when I wanted. I could go to and from if I made a mistake and went in the wrong direction. And of course, traveling by Shinkansen for me was a treat in itself. Sitting back, reserved seats, looking at the scenery just fly by, enjoying a bento box and sipping beer while watching Mount Fuji. It was an experience and an adventure in itself. So, no regrets there. Something you really do need to take into account, however, is that JR is not the only transportation company in Japan. So you may probably need to have a separate transportation budget outside of the JR Pass, especially for subway lines. In most large cities, you will be able to get around using only JR lines, like figuring it out, especially in places like Tokyo, where you have the Yamanote line, which is a circular line which has most major stops, and it's in central Tokyo, and it is a JR line. So you can make it work to your advantage, but it could happen that either the line you want to take is closed, like for me in Osaka, 
Um, I wasn't exactly close to a chair line, but I could walk 20 minutes or so just to get it if I really wanted to not pay the other companies and only use my Jera Pass. But when the typhoon hit, all Jera lines were closed and I was stuck using the Midasuji line, which was another company and I used it every day. So I did have to have a separate budget. And not only for subway, you might need to take into consideration things like ropeways and cable cars or also buses. If you're going to Kyoto. And the easiest way to be using other forms of transportation if you're not using the Jera Pass or if you don't have a Jera Pass is to use an IC card like Suica card or Pasmo card which are just cards where you put your money and when you pass through the gates you just scan it and the correct amount is deducted for the station you're leaving and the station you're going to arrive to. It makes it so much easier because otherwise you need to calculate that from that station to that station is going to be X amount of money so I need to buy buy a ticket for 700 yen for example that's a lot of money i'm just, <laughs> just that's the first amount that came to it's very tricky so you just need that suica card and just scan it and you can also use it on um, vending machines and some stores and it only costs you 500 yen deposit which you can get back if you want to give that card back to get your money back. Really save yourself the hassle and get an IC card. I got both my JR Pass activated and a my Suica card at the JR booth at Narita Airport on arrival. So everything done at once and I was set for my trip. So here are a few more transportation tips from me to you. Look into other passes for each area you're going to be staying at because it could be more convenient for you. There are passes like the Kansa Area Pass, the Osaka amazing pass or the Hakone free pass and there are many many more so before you think that JR pass might be the only option just maybe look into combining different passes for each area it might be better suited for you another tip is to familiarize yourself like just take a minute to familiarize yourself with the main subway lines and the main transportation map of the city slash area you're going to be staying at. You will save yourself a lot of time and a lot of hair pulling. And finally, don't be afraid to ask the staff, even if you don't speak their language and they don't speak yours, they will always be happy to help. There's always a way to communicate. So, second big expense, JR Pass, 443 euros, ding ding ding. Finally, we get to accommodation, the place where you're practically going to be living in during this, your stay in Japan. And for me, I'd say that there are about 40 ways for you to sleep in Japan. Well, actually, there are definitely more than that, but here are the four that I considered when booking my sleeping arrangements. Business hotels, Airbnb, capsule hotels, hostels. Business hotels being the most expensive and hostels being the cheapest. Now seeing that I didn't stay in a business hotel because I couldn't find one that was within my price range, I'm not going to go over it, but know that it is a viable option. They can have, you can have a small room in a business hotel to yourself for reasonable prices, just not reasonable enough for my little old budget. Now price-wise, Airbnbs, capsule hotels and hostels don't have that much of a price gap, but it can be about saving 5, 10, 20 euros per night, depending on the choice you make, which can be quite a big deal. I stayed in both hostels and capsule hotels in Tokyo, and then two Airbnbs, one in Osaka and in Hiroshima. And I'd say I pretty much got the best of both worlds because I was lucky for all of my locations and all accommodations and they were adapted to how I needed and where I needed to be at the time if that makes sense. I'll get to it in just a second. It was a nice thing at a hostel in Tokyo because I wasn't alone, completely alone in a foreign country on arrival. The hosts were nice, friendly and kind and helpful and there were other people, other travelers around and I feel like I really lucked out with the place that I chose to stay which was Toko because it was really a beautiful place to stay, it was well located, everything was clean, the other the hosts were really kind and breakfasts in the morning and hang out at the bar in the evening for a drink it was just it was perfect for me and coming home after a long day you were welcomed by by everyone it just it just felt like a little home 
in such a big city the only thing that you need to get used to is the shared living area so sleeping in dorms mixed dorms or uh, segregated dorms and then um queuing for the bathroom or the showers etc etc in the end it just felt really homely uh, capsule hotels are different in a way that you feel more maybe independent people tend to keep to themselves and you have your own little sleeping square and it can be a nice change, especially if you've been doing the whole community social living thing. It does, it can sometimes be nice to take a night off just to be by yourself, with yourself and at a capsule hotel. Uh, I picked an Airbnb in Osaka mainly because I couldn't find something suitable for me in Kyoto. A lot of places were already booked or really expensive. So an Airbnb seemed like to be the best option and I could go to and from Osaka to Kyoto and Nara on my JR Pass so it was really easy and accessible. It did end up being the cheapest option and even though at first it felt really strange being alone in a little flat in a new city and everything was really quiet after being in dorms for an entire week, it did feel nice and it became a little home to come back to every evening and the best thing was, I think, to be able to spread out my things and just have an open suitcase instead of having to pack everything in back in lockers. It was a nice break and I think Airbnbs, well, the ones where you get a flat to yourself, not necessarily the homestay type of Airbnbs, which I didn't get to experience, when you get your own flat, it does give you a chance to regroup and recenter and repack your suitcase and it does feel quite nice especially if you're a bit of an introvert like me so i had an airbnb in osaka and i also had one in hiroshima and it felt really nice and really peaceful so like i said i feel like i had the best of both worlds all in all pick somewhere that feels right for you and suits your needs even if you have to pay a little extra for things like comfort for example if you have a bad back you need to find somewhere adapted to you a bad night's sleep could have a serious impact on your mood and the rest of your trip so read reviews look at the photos um, figure out if the area is right for you well located and generally safe also you're gonna thank me for this but dorm room survival kit earplugs eye mask water tissues and something that lights up like your phone or a, a flashlight you need that believe me you need that okay so now i would say that the big expenses are done they're put aside but there are things that you could still be looking into such as having an internet connection on your phone on location in Japan. And while some of us will be okay using Wi-Fi hotspots and going to Starbucks to check emails, others will need, like really need, <laughs> an internet connection to get around. That was me, seriously. Look at my vlogs, I got lost all the time. I can't read a map. So I was dead set on having GPS internet connection on my phone in Japan. Options available, either you rent a portable Wi-Fi and that comes around 170 euros without insurance, but I think you have larger data usage. Uh, it can be good if uh, you are with a bunch of people, you can all use it and it does cover the expense. Or you can just do what I did and get a tourist SIM card for 25 euros. And I got the one gigabyte one, yes, I got the one gigabyte. Um, and I made it last, it lasted me throughout my whole trip, though I did use it rather sparingly. There, however, once for 2 gig and you can recharge so don't stress yourself over that the prices will vary but it will be cheaper than the portable wi-fi this is the one i use i think this is another available option it's really easy to set up though i'm not gonna lie it was the guys from big camera who set it up for me so yay even easier your usage will obviously depend on what you're needs your internet connection for. I know there are a ton of travel apps that you could be using on the daily like Odigo, TripAdvisor, Foursquare, Hyperdia, Metroman in Osaka, Tokyo Subway, Pan Wi-Fi, Navitime. Ultimately I didn't end up using any of those even though I had them installed on my phone and I only ended up using I think four apps with my internet connection and I'm gonna give them to you right now. So first of all do me and yourself a favor and get maps.me on your phone and download all the Japan maps once you're connected to Wi-Fi because this is a map app that works offline. You only need to download the maps when you're connected and then 
it will become a lifesaver. It was for me when I didn't have my SIM card yet. It did, it did help me get around. It does have sometimes a little slightly odd itineraries, but you always get where you need to go and it will save you from getting lost. Not gonna lie though, once I got my SIM card, I went back to Google Maps. So that was a second app, Google Maps total lifesaver couldn't have done without. I used Google Translate a little bit, it did help out. And I used HelloTalk, how many fingers do I have? That's too much for. I use HelloTalk, which is a language exchange app, and I use it to ask questions to my Japanese correspondents. So that's the internet sorted. I did also obviously use social media, email and Instagram, but I use it when I was connected to a Wi-Fi. So as I mentioned before, it might seem like all the big expenses are done. Well, it kind of depends on how you handle this next part, which is preparing for the actual trip. As someone who lives in a tiny flat with not a lot of storage space and who doesn't really travel that often, sadly, sniff sniff, I didn't want to go and buy big bulking suitcases and not having the opportunity to use them that often, again, sadly, sniff sniff. So what I did is just made a list of the things I had, things I needed and started asking around. Anything you can borrow, a euro saved here, a euro saved there is a euro that you can use in Japan. Tell yourself that. Be that person and ask around for things that you can Para. My next tip would be to research through the infamous travel hacks type of video. Also review tips from seasoned professional travelers because there might just be something there for you. Some of them might be way out there but there might be something that could make a huge difference for you and save you some of these. I'd also suggest that you browse through Amazon even if you aren't going to buy anything. It could help you not forget certain items because of how they like to suggest things that people have often bought together. See what I mean? So it could remind you to buy locks or luggage tags or adapters, big one adapters. Mm -hmm. You'll thank me later. Finally, don't panic, don't overpack. I know you're going to be far away from home, but you don't need as much as you think you're going to need. Make lists per category, toiletries, um, electronics, etc. And also, I found that it helped to make one separate list of the things that would be really bad if you forgot one of them, like passport, for example. Everything outside that list, just tell yourself that worst case scenario, you can repurchase them. For some reason, you forgot your socks. Japan has socks. I know it's an extra expense, but just be chill. You probably don't need as much as you think you do. You won't have to spend as much as you think prior to traveling. In the end, I had one large half empty suitcase, a backpack as my carry-on and my purse. And that way I could shop and fill up my suitcase. Just be careful to wear your suitcase before coming home. So maybe investing in a portable luggage wear might be something you want to do or look into borrowing and also look up customs um, for your country in and out to avoid fines. Here are a few more things to check off your to-do list before you leave for your big adventure. First of all, have travel insurance. In my case it costs 65 euro but better safe than sorry. Two, talk to your bank and make sure all your cars are ready to be used abroad. Three, order some yen in advance. I think it's good to have a little bit with you before you leave and it actually might turn out to be cheaper depending on the exchange rates. I know nothing about that but you will feel a little safer having yen in advance. Know a little about your currency. It will make you less nervous to know what is what rather than have to fumble through everything once you arrive at a checkout counter. I do recommend that you have a some sort of travel journal where you have all your information in one space. You research your itineraries, your phone numbers, your reservation numbers, your tips, your maps, everything in one journal. And you could also include things like um, a few survival basic sentences in Japanese. And I also recommend for certain things, write your itinerary from A to B, station to station, write down the exits because it could really save you a lot of time. Some subway stations are just gigantic. Travel journal, really useful, really recommend you get one. How to save money on location. You've arrived, you're there, you made it. Time for your first meal in Japan, but wait, how much is it? There are many ways to save money in Japan, but I'm only gonna tell you a few of these which are kind of common sense because at this stage, 
at this stage of your trip, the point is not to start hacking your way through Japan and counting your coins. The point is to have fun with what you have. You're here, you arrived, have fun. First, prioritize. What's more important to you? Shopping, museum, temples, food, a bit of everything. Spend your money on what's most important to you. I'd recommend you set yourself a daily budget. Now this budget isn't ironclad or anything. It's an idea, a number for you to hold you accountable. It's a figure for you to stay close to. You don't have to stick to it. It's something you shouldn't stray too far from. My daily budget was around 5,000 yen per day. Some days I'd only spend 3,000 yen and others I'd go as far as spending 8,000 yen. But having that number in my head kept me responsible and accountable because believe me, money just disappeared appear and you don't even see it go. So have a daily budget, but don't let it stress you out. If you can walk, you walk. <laughs> I walked everywhere in Japan, everywhere I could go to avoid the extra subway charges, I walked because as I've mentioned, even with a JR pass, sometimes those lines aren't available to you in certain areas. So the added expense of subway ride after subway ride, when it adds up, it can suck out a huge portion of your budget. So. Walking is good, walking is healthy, as long as it's not chucking down with rain. Try to walk as much as you could, enjoy the scenery, it just walk. Food. Konbinis are great, especially if you need a small break from eating out and you need to, uh, a few low budget meals to balance your daily budget again. Konbinis have everything you need and I had onigiri breakfast almost every day and I loved it and it was cheap and it was marvelous and yeah, konbinis will be your best friend, they are everywhere. Sorry, konbinis are convenience stores, uh, if you didn't know. And uh, yeah, also the equivalent of fast food in Japan is a healthy, cheap alternative. Healthier than the typical Western fast food. So you can just have a bowl of ramen, noodle soup or rice and curry and it won't break your wallet or your belly, I guess. <laughs> Okay, real quick, um, know what's expensive in Japan. Fruits are expensive, so stay away from fruit. I'm sure there are other things. Fruit is what just came uh, off the top of my head because I really miss fruit, but know what's expensive. And finally, have fun. It's your trip. It's your damn trip. Have fun. Okay, here are some extra travel tips for you in Japan, which may or may not help you out. Just thought I'd add them in there while we're at it. Throw them in the pack. Um, Japan is one of the safest countries out there, but don't let that fact make you let your guard down because a big city is a big city and it's always when you feel too relaxed that something could happen and I don't want to scare you, but just... Japan is safe, but be smart. If you're tired of having a really heavy backpack to carry around all day, or bags or anything, Coin lockers might be something to look into. There are coin lockers everywhere, train stations, subway stations, everywhere. So you can just leave it in there and come and get it at the end of the day. Be sure though to know where you're leaving your bag. Take photos of the locker and its surroundings so you can find it at the end of the day when you're tired and everything just looks the same and yeah. Please know your basic etiquette. Wherever you're traveling, know the basic etiquette of the country you're going to and for Japan, just don't be that, that foreign person. Don't remove, take off your shoes when you need to take them off, don't blow your nose in public. Um, walking and eating is frowned on. There are a bunch of little things you can do to be courteous and respectful, so look into that. And finally, be prepared for anything. You never know. I mean, I was in Osaka for a typhoon land, for goodness sake. <laughs> Strawberry umbrella. <sighs> we got there in the end. Those were all the steps I took for my solo trip to Japan on a budget. And as you can see, I'm still alive after that trip. Not sure after this video though, I may need to check my pulse. I went to Japan, came back and had the best time ever so I do hope some of those tips will help you have as much fun as I did. I know it's difficult to say exactly how much I ended up spending. I gave you the main expenses and hopefully that is a basic enough idea of how much it approximately came down to in the end. Let me know if you have tips and recommendations of your own. Leave them down in the comments and if you have other questions 
don't hesitate to ask i will do my best to respond the best thing to do guys listen up the best thing to do because i have been getting a lot of the same questions in the comments and also through private messages people sending me messages asking what my recommendations would be and things like that the best thing to do at this point is to tweet me at ecotree using the hashtag ask ecotree that way i can see which questions are the most important for you guys and i will make a dedicated video answering your questions so please don't hesitate to do that it is the best way for you to get a proper answer from me so thank you for taking the time to do that i feel like i've just given a class dissertation though hopefully it didn't feel that way for you and that i could help you out slash inspire you to make that dream trip of yours whether it's in japan or anywhere else whether you're alone in a group have money no money just yeah <laughs> that's my goal i hope i helped you out i cannot wait to go back to japan thank you all for watching if you made it this far i mean thank you so much i know it was long but i really wanted to get everything in this video i outward you all tweet me your questions and i will see you very soon in the next video bye and we all know people who have lots of misfortune and they are